Hello, Andre. Hi, David. How are you doing? I'm all right, thank you. This is an all West Coast edition of Blogging Heads here in Arizona. I am in uh, California today, California. Uh, in, right in Oakland, California. And I'm in Whistler, British Columbia. Um, in much, much nicer Arizona. than Oakland. <laughs> it's a great place, actually. Um, and we have a lot to talk about. Uh, so, um, uh, and I, I think people um, have a rough idea of your biography. You um, worked in the Clinton White House. You were a speechwriter there, or Vice right. President Gore. Am I right about that? Uh, exactly. And uh, you're co-editor of the uh, uh, Left Center um, Intellectual Journal Democracy. Right. And you're the author of a new book. A new book called The Candy Ber- Bombers. Exactly. About the Berlin Airlift. Right. And America after World War II. Okay. And and we're going to get we're going to deal with all of those facets of, of your of your personality. Let, let's start with um, a little talk of, uh, about speeches and. Speech making. I worked as a speechwriter, of course, in the, in, in the Bush White House, and uh, uh, I have kind of a descent from the uh, acclamation of Barack Obama's oratory. But maybe you want, as somebody maybe more sympathetic to him, uh, to begin by telling us what you think of him as a speech maker. Well, I'd be interested to see your take. I think uh, he has clearly, in my mind, shown great chops as a speech maker. Uh, as a, uh, in some ways, a speech writer, a lot of his uh, remarks are ones that he's taken a big hand in crafting himself. And I think it is a uh, real kind of testament that he's been able to do something a little bit different in terms of his speeches than you usually see from Democrats. And this may be something that you're uh, thinking about, but his speeches, to me, are uh, much more... I guess to use the word Reagan-esque, than some other speeches we've seen from other Democrats in that they, uh, and even from many Republicans, in that they really speak to larger American values much more than the specifics. I think sometimes he's gotten away f- too much from the specifics, and that has uh, in some ways been a hook that people can put the uh, sense on him that he hasn't been offering enough specifics. But on the whole, I think his ability to really summon these larger themes uh, in his speeches is something that has uh, been transformative in the way that I think a lot of Democrats look at how the art of oratory is practiced in the 21st century. I, I have That is exactly the point on, on which I, I would criticize him, uh, that he is making, it seems to me, great 19th century speeches. Mm. But the... Uh, uh, great speeches to be delivered um, in the open air to a crowd. I'm, and uh, by all reports, I've never heard, been there in person when we spoke, they have incredible effects on the people who hear them, who, of course, are predisposed to agree with him and to like them. Um, they don't work uh, for the era, era of mass communication, for the era of radio and television. I always divide, I think 1920 is the cutoff point with all, um, all speeches before 1920 on one side and all of those after 1920. Um, on another. And I, I thought the point where we saw the flaws in his approach was with his much praised uh, speech in Philadelphia on race, where he had to deal with a very dangerous political problem that had just arisen, um, the Reverend Wright problem. And there was this question, how could you have sat there um, in that church for all those years while the, this man said these terrible things? And his answer was, before I respond to that question, I need to talk to you for about an hour about race and about the meaning of America, and about our history. And mm-hmm. I just kept it's like, uh, General Washington, did you or did you not, with that your little hatchet, chop down that cherry tree? Well, before I can answer that, we have to talk about trees, we have to talk about hatchets, we have to talk about men. And uh, there was a really a simple question before him, and he didn't answer it. And one of the problems in this media age is when a, a question that is unanswered does not go away, it, it lingers. And uh, and people then draw their own conclusions. Uh, and oh. that what is striking to me about his oratory is it's so very oratorical, and it's so very non-persuasive. It's not intended to convince. It's con- um, it's intended to soothe. I mean, I, I, Tom Wolf has this line about the Sunday New York Times. This is not a newspaper to read. This is a newspaper to bathe in. And there's something there's something about that in in, in him that I I wonder I wonder whether it will wear well. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I, I guess I would say that. In your description of the media age, we have to draw a distinction. I think that his oratory is very much not suited for a 20th century kind of media age. 
where sound bites, which of course have been part of history going back to the Sermon on the Mount, where sound bites were so important, the area of radio and of television, you really needed to capture what you're saying in a short snippet. I think it's interesting to see whether his oratory is in fact better suited for an era of this kind of online communication, where once again you can have a long-form kind of dialogue with people. Uh, that's yeah. part of the promise of the whole Internet age, is that people will walk the two of us talk for half an hour, 45 minutes, and that they'll listen to Barack Obama not just give the 30-second or 15-second or 10-second answer on race, but will listen to him for half an hour. And the amount that that YouTube clip was downloaded of that speech, I think, speaks to that. From what I understand, and this may or may not be true, but I've heard that he actually went through that race speech and basically scrubbed out everything that could be that kind of soundbite in order to force people to actually listen to the whole thing. And I think that speaks to whether or not we're entering a very different kind of age. I mean, I think somebody I admire very much as an orator, Tony Blair, was in some ways the perfect orator for the end of the TV age because he didn't... He, kind of lost entire sentence constructions and spoke in, in short snippets even sometimes uh, of a few words that uh, lacked a verb or so on. But uh, I think Obama is, in some ways, I think you're right, hearkening back to something that we had before. But his oratory is long form, but it's not in the kind of flights of rhetoric that you would imagine with a Edward Everett or somebody like that back in the yeah. 19th century. Uh, it is very modern, it is very straightforward in his language, uh, but it is, again, it is not a short soundbite. Well, what you say there is so so interesting and offers a chance to go listen to this next topic I want to address, but let me just say something. That straightforward is the very last term that I would use to describe um, Barack Obama. I think you made a... That, that is news to me about him scrubbing the speech of, of quotable phrases, but it makes and total that, that sense. That may or may not be true. It's, it's what I heard through the grapevine. Well, but... But it's, it's some, it happens. I mean, one of the things that is really striking about Barack Obama, I've, I've been sort of suffering through his um, long book, Dream, Dreams of My Father. And one of the things, it's, it, it, it's, it's very hard to quote. I mean, I'm trying to blog it and to take snippets from it. And because the book's, you know, a book, I have to type the snippets rather than just pull them off uh, as you do with the newspaper or something someone else's type. And you're, you're confronting having to, in order to convey an idea, you have to be prepared to type 2,500 or 2,800 words and even if I typed all that, I have no confidence that on a blog anybody's going to read it. Um, that there's something I find about him that um, he uses language to keep you at bay. And that was very true of that, that race speech. Um, that ultimately, if I were to say to you, okay, Andre, what did he say? What was his answer to the question? How could you sit there while this terrible man said these terrible things? Uh, there isn't really an answer, is there? Well, I think what he was saying was that he was reframing the question, that... that uh, the fact that we are so obsessed with what did he, what, why did he sit there and how he could sit there speaks to a larger set of concerns. Right. And I think, look, for a Democrat, uh, he said some things that he, you haven't heard most Democrats say about uh, things like affirmative action, busing, and things like that. In some ways, it harkened back to me of listening to Bill Clinton talk, uh, again, I would say courageously about some of those things back in 1991, 1992. Except and that's probably the last time you've heard a Democrat really tackle some of those things head on. And but what, you're, what you would call reframing the question, I think a lot of us would call avoiding the question. Well, because it depends on what the question those is. Are, you know, his thoughts on those, on those matters are of greater or lesser interest, but there's a very specific question, and he said, I'm not going to answer it. If I, took, if I just said no comment or eight sec here's eight seconds in which I'm not going to answer, that would look evasive. But if I talk for an hour about everything except the question in your mind, you can't accuse me of non-responsiveness, but yet the question does go, does go unanswered. You know, I, I, I'm struck by your your thought your your claim that this is some, in the 21st century we're going to have a lot of people listening to this. I mean, I, I, what what are the numbers I and mean, how many people did download the the thing from YouTube in its entirety? Do you happen to? to get I don't know the numbers offhand, but I know it was a hugely downloaded clip. Uh, but yeah. tens of thousands, I, I hundreds I, I of thousands of people. Hundreds, of, yeah, hundreds of thousands. I, I, I don't know, maybe more than that. It was just, I, uh, I'm sure we can find the numbers, but uh, it was incre It was just a YouTube sensation for those a few days af afterwards. 
But, but let me ask you, as, as an editor of a, a journal called Democracy, um, I, I, I wonder um, whether you are your optimism about the way politics is going to work in the 21st century is so so well placed. I mean, it's true. Hundreds of thousands of people probably watch that speech, and there are probably dozens of people who will watch, or maybe a dozen, um, who will watch the two of us talk for an hour. If, if my uh, mother can figure figure this out, they'll have 13. So, <laughs> uh, but. I mean, we're dealing with a world in which um, the best at informed Americans are so much better informed than ever. I mean, the days when you could consider yourself well-informed if you read the local paper and the and a, a big news weekly published in New York and watched the evening news, those days are long gone. But um, there is some reason to fear that like the bottom half of the population, maybe even the bottom two-thirds, is much less well-informed than they were in 1970. I mean, they read the they don't read newspapers anymore. They're not watching news. Uh, and I sometimes wonder whether that the seeming democratic promise of the Internet um, is not actually a false promise. And whether what is part of making American politics more oligarchic um, and dividing those who are in the political nation. The political nation, the intensely political nation is big, but the political nation is, does, does not include the whole nation as much as it used to do. Well, that's always been the question people have been asking about the Internet and about this entire technological revolution, you know, going back to the debates we used to have in the 1990s about the digital divide. And, you know, it used to be, I remember when I was in the, in the Clinton White House, and any time you would say something positive about the Internet, you couldn't say that without immediately turning around and saying, but of course, for half of Americans, or whatever the number was, they have no access to this. And those days are gone. I mean, that digital divide has been largely bridged, and right. it's keep on it keeps on getting bridged. The, it, the this it, it's not a matter of access. I mean, one of the things, you know, we uh, in, in the old. I mean, the reason people, everybody watched Walter Cronkite in 1965 was not because everybody had access. It was because at 6:30 there was nothing else on. Uh, if you wanted to watch TV, you had to watch the news. That's what there was. Um, what, but but it, we, what we had is a proliferation of choices, and right. that doesn't mean that uh, any of those choices are giving people less information. It's maybe a different kind of information. It's more opinionated information in some ways, again, hearkening back to what we saw in an earlier part of American history. But I, I think that we're seeing time and time again that every time people say that this bottom half, this bottom whatever percentage is not going to come along, it has come along. And just look at the, the way that... Uh, campaign contributions have been re revolutionized just in this past uh, cycle with the untold millions, uh, probably reaching a billion that Barack Obama is going to raise online. Uh, that's a lot of people getting involved in the political process and people who, again, were not just at the very top, which used to be everybody who gave political uh, contributions, but people up and down the income spectrum. So I think that you are seeing a lot of interest out there in the uh, in the internet age, and that, that even those choices are not uh, giving people the uh, reason to opt out, but are giving people different avenues of actually accessing information. Well, maybe the story is just that that our Republican people are opting out because it was always true that the Republican Party raised lots and lots of money in small donations. Right. Um, ba back in the this is now completely obsolete information, but I remember back in the 80s, the point was often made that the median size of a Democratic uh, uh, donation was like almost $1,000 because everybody who gave money to the Democratic Party was giving all the then maximum of $1,000, and the median donation to the Republican Party was, was $50 because they would respond to direct mail about the hot button okay. issues, guns, and so on. And that, um, one of the things that has happened since the later 1990s, and especially um, since George Bush became president, is a collapse in the small dollar fundraising of the Republican Party. Uh, and I, I, I don't have um, in front of me the figures on, on uh, McCain's fundraising, but he had a pretty good month in April. He raised uh, $17 million, his, his record. But I, I would guess that much of that money arrived in very large donations. Um, Possibly, and, and that was still uh, less than what Hillary Clinton raised, who right. was eclipsed by Barack Obama. And so, right, the two, you take the the two, two Democrats, Democrats together raised, I think, 52 million, million in April, right. and McCain raised 17, 31. And what is even more disturbing, if you're uh, a Republican, is that uh, despite waging this battle with Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama ended the month with twice as much cash on hand as John McCain. 
and but I think I think you know you you do make a important point about uh, what kind of media, what kind of conversation, what kind of uh, information is going to be conveyed in the 21st century. You, you mentioned my journal. In some ways, we took a bet that uh, there is a place going to be for something that in many respects seems anachronistic, that we started a journal based on long-form, 3,000-word think pieces uh, that doesn't have a blog, that doesn't uh, have the kind of instantaneous uh, response to whatever is going on in the news. We're quarterly, and uh, we have made a decision to say that there is, even in this era of uh, blogs and blogging heads TV and everything else, a place for that kind of uh, journal, a place for that kind of work being done, and that they, we need to keep a place for that, even though starting that kind of journal in 2005 when we started it uh, struck many people as hearkening back to something that hasn't been really at the forefront since the 1960s. Yeah, yeah uh, but these magazines, I mean, the public interest is the classic example. Sure. Um, uh, that in many ways you can look at you know, 25 years of Republican politics is simply executing the ideas that were propounded in the pages of the public interest between 1967 and 1978. Um, and we, we, the problem is we've now worked through that inventory and, and we're depleted. And we don't seem to be generating on my side of the aisle uh, anymore. I, cons- I don't mean principles. I mean, the princ- how many principles do you have? Yeah. Two, three, something like that. But policy ideas, things that actually could turn into legislation, could turn into a presidential commitment. Um, it's, it's kind of worrying if you're on the Republican side. Um, but we have, and, and maybe I'm just sensitive to this because I've been in a little, I, I, I uh, had, uh, I don't know what you call it, the honor, uh, the dubious honor of being uh, singled out twice in the past week by Rush Limbaugh for, for criticism, for watering down conservatism. And one of the things that I, I'm struck by is not only have we exhausted the inventory of those ideas laid down in the public interest, but in fact we have to, conservatism now has to, charge this headwind of act, active opposition to serious thinking about our, our problems. And you've got this tremend- these tremendously powerful voices that speak to a lot of people. I mean, only a tenth of the country and, um, you know, uh, a sixth, sixth or seventh of the electorate, so not enough actually to win, but enough to block change uh, that says anybody who ever reconsiders anything while you're selling up the core principles of our party. It feels a little bit like the teachers' unions and the Democratic Party since 1984. It's, I, you know, what you said about the public interest, I think, is right, and I think you make this point very persuasively in your book about those ideas. And, you know, when we started Democracy, we actually went back and did a lot of study about how do ideas make it into the political process. And, it, and you're right, it's not just principles. Our parties, our philosophies have a, a set of a few principles, and it's not even policies, right? It's not just the... Uh, pieces of legislation you're introduced, it is the kind of big transformative ideas that define a political movement. And you can go into the pages of the public interest and really every core big idea of the Republican Party over the past 20 years and then some, has, as you said, came out of those kinds of pages, whether it is Social Security reform, uh, whether it is supply side and the Laffer curve, uh, whether it is faith-based initiatives, uh, some of the neoconservative foreign policy ideas came out of the, the national interest in places like that, that really you did have this idea engine in the Republican Party, and for a long time you didn't have it in the Democratic Party. And, you know, I think you're very right about the current uh, kind of state of disrepair of the Republican uh, idea machine. But for a long time for Democrats, there was also the sense, I think, that we also didn't need ideas. We had figured it out. We just basically needed to reframe our message, uh, to state our case more loudly and more convincingly, and that one of these days, if we keep on saying it louder and louder and uh, in smarter and smarter ways, eventually people are going to come around. And, you know, for me, I think that uh, I came to a sense working on the Kerry campaign in 2004 that we just didn't have the right ideas, that we were in a very delicate moment in American history. I, I completely agree that the Republican uh, and conservative ideas, a lot of them have been enacted and have succeeded on things like crime, which you've talked about in, in your book. A lot of them have been enacted and haven't worked, at least in my opinion. 
whether it is economic ideas, whether it is some of the foreign policy ideas. And those ideas have run their course. Um, they, you know, we had Republicans controlling all three branches of government, really, for the first time since the 1920s, and a lot of those ideas were able to be enacted and, in my opinion, failed. Conversely, though, on the Democratic side, we were not putting forward those same kind of ideas that would actually respond to this moment. And it's a moment with, as you've talked about as well, a lot of huge threats in terms of international threats, in terms of challenges we're facing in an era of globalization in the United States. And it seems to me that so far, neither of neither the progressives nor the conservatives have actually been able to enunciate a clear set of ideas that is as ambitious in responding to this current moment as people in earlier eras were able to do successfully in responding to their own challenges. Well, let, let me, uh, I mean, that does lead naturally to a discussion of, of the story that you tell in the, in the Candy Bombers, which, um, whose great underlying theme, I mean, the United States and Germany fought these two terrible wars uh, in the 20th century. Um, in, in the first, the United States was an important but not decisive uh, combatant in the second, of course, the United States was the decisive combatant, uh, ter- inflicted terrible suffering on Germany. A lot of Americans, of course, uh, lost their lives as well. And out of that horrific experience um, came an international friendship as close as any uh, on on the planet, any in the history of international relations. As we look at some of the you know seemingly implacable conflicts of civilization that many people diagnose around us, um, I wonder whether your experience with your work on that book uh, gives you any thoughts about the international future. Absolutely. It's, uh, the story we usually hear is, you know, World War II ended and suddenly America and Germany became friends, and of course it wasn't that simple. There was a great deal of hatred built up on both sides, and really for the first few years of the American occupation of Germany, the occupation was failing in some very fundamental ways, really just by every measure that you could possibly put together of what we wanted to have happen in that occupation, things were going in the wrong direction. Social service, science surveys, polls that were being done in Germany were showing that uh, the German people were becoming more pro-authoritarian, uh, more pro-Nazi even, more opposed to the principles of democracy than they were in 1945 as the occupation went on. And it really took the experience of, I argue in the book, the Berlin Airlift, to really change that dynamic around. And so for me, it was a a set of lessons about what we're doing in the world today, about how we are acting not only in places like Iraq and some of the uh, problems we've been having in that occupation, but really just generally. I mean, this was a moment for the Berlin Airlift when America was really at the peak of the sense in the world that we were on the side of goodness and decency and being a force for spreading democracy around the world, a peak that we probably haven't reclaimed since then. My, my mother, my late mother, who was born in 1937, uh, always talked about that as the first, and she's, she was in Canada, which is an American by, by nationality. That was the first political experience of her life, being, really? being aware of uh, the Berlin airlift. And that shaped, your at, that shaped her attitudes for a lifetime about America's role in the world and what America could do. Well, it was, it was, you know, shaped people all around the world, and it was really this moment when America really stood at the summit of world power, really for the first time ever in a, in a time other than World War One and World War Two, and we gave a very strong impression about America that had a special mission in the world and that acted in a special way in the world, that we were not just another power, but were a country that's very being was about spreading a sense of humanity to people. Um, now, here, you know, here's my question that follows yeah. from that, and, and this may challenge some of the um, sunnier side of, of, of your liberalism. In the United States, after the Indonesian tsunami, uh, did a sea lift that was probably in absolute terms vastly more generous uh, than anything that was done for Berlin. You could just move more stuff. Um, people were uh, that, um, that much more desperate. It seems to have had no enduring political effect. Is the is it possible that the most important part of the story is not the American airlift, but the Soviet blockade? That is, that the Germans were drawn to America not by the attractiveness of American culture and the generosity of the American response, true though those things were, but by their absolute terror of the Soviet alternative. Well, 
that certainly has to, has to play into it, and, that, and that's part of it. It's not the whole story, because, you know, in the midst of the Soviet blockade, the Soviets offered the people of western part of Berlin uh, the ability to have basically a huge amount of rations. And you have to remember, this is not just the blockade, but it was three years of starvation rations before then. They said that we'll give you basically all the food you can eat, just about, uh, if you'll sign a pledge card to, to the Soviets pledging our loyalty. So there was that promise of something attractive, and only 4% of West Berliners signed that card, choosing to really, in many cases, starve rather than to give their loyalty over to the Soviets. And that was something that was unexpected because, again, throughout the occupation, pollsters had been asking people in Berlin the question, what would you prefer? Would you prefer a government that offers you economic security uh, or one that offers you freedom of press, freedom of uh, speech, and, and so on? And every single time, by two to one, Berliners had chosen a government that offered them economic security. And that switched for the first time during the airlift and blockade. Uh, and so, to me, that says that this debate we've had between left and right about the, whether the right way to spread American values is either through military force on one side or through economic force, uh, through a martial plan for wherever on the other side, is a debate that doesn't get at a third force, which is this idea of spreading American values and winning hearts and minds, and that that is done through some very different means of really showing a sense to the world about what America is really about. So what, what implications, what lessons uh, would you draw for today? You know, I think that, in my opinion, if, the, if it had just been an airlift alone of... Uh, food and supplies, the airlift would have failed, that the people of Berlin would have moved towards the Soviets. I think what really changed the whole character and tenor of the airlift uh, was the individual action of one person who started dropping candy to the children of Berlin. And this story has been recounted as something that's a human interest story and kind of a sentimental uh, sideshow to the main action. But in my opinion, and from the research I've done in talking to people, it really did have this enormous effect of showing people that we were not just bringing them food for our own interests, not just doing so because they were a chess piece in a battle with the Soviet Union, but that we actually cared about them for uh, means without any ulterior motive. And that, I think, played very clearly into uh, what happened in Berlin. I think it happens today. I mean, every time that you have somebody like President Bush saying that we're fighting the terrorists in Iraq so we don't fight them here. It sends a message to the Iraqi people that we're not actually interested in their future. We're interested in keeping the battle over there uh, so that it doesn't affect us in our future. Uh, that's a very different kind of message than we were sending to the people of Germany during the Berlin Airlift. Uh, well, Michael Yan has written a, a very interesting new book. He's a military blogger. He's written a new, new book about uh, the American experience in Iraq uh, called Moment of Truth in Iraq. Um, he documents all kinds of extraordinary, courageous, and humanitarian actions by individual American soldiers. Um, and it does not seem to have had the effect there of the kind of candy bombing that you were describing. Right. And, uh, you know, clearly so many uh, individual soldiers have uh, just taken heroic steps uh, as well as just very prosaic steps on a daily basis of uh, kindness to the Iraqi people. I think that has been drowned out in Iraq by things like Abu Ghraib, things like shooting up a Koran. Uh, those, uh, maybe it's just our media age, I'm not sure, but I think that those kind of incidents have uh, clearly had more of an impact on what's happened in Iraq than the individual actions of the vast majority of uh, people who are serving there. And I think that it also, you know, we can't just isolate the uh, things like candy dropping or, or the things that individual soldiers have done. We're also dealing with a situation where for a long time you had a security situation in Iraq that prevented any kind of forward movement, any kind of uh, really strong community building uh, in big parts of the country at least. Uh, and that played a, a big role as well. I mean, we, you know, I think you look at the number of uh, troops we went into Germany with, uh, 
and the size of that occupation force versus the relative size of what happened in Iraq. And I think that's part of the problem we had, too, which is that we weren't able to simply uh, have the kind of uh, uh, security where you can, and the kind of sense of a community where you can actually build things towards democracy. Well, um, you, you talk about the, you're, you're sort of present at the creation of the American uh, German friendship. I, one of the things I, I worry a lot about uh, is the, co- the coming to an end of, not that relationship won't end, but of its dwindling significance in world affairs. And you mentioned your relationship with the Kerry campaign. One of the things that Kerry talked to a lot about in 2004 was the importance of rebuilding relations with the um, traditional European allies. And well, who could be against that? Um, and uh, certainly it's true that he had the case. And the, the English have this wonderful definition of a gentleman that I like very much, which is someone who never gives offense unintentionally. And by, by that definition, uh, Donald Rumsfeld and George Bush were no gentlemen because we gave a lot of offense that we didn't need to give. But it's also true that there was something deeply reactionary and backward looking about those statements of Kerry. And when you look at, um, uh, you know, the pr- projections of the past, if the past 20 years or 25 years carries forward for the next 20 years, uh, the share of world, con- uh, world output that is going to be generated in Europe and Japan, um, that these two regions of great post-war relationships are, are going to be dwindling as factors in world affairs. America, not so much. Um, my friend Fareed Zakaria has a new book out, which I have not yet read, uh, which is a title, The Post-American World. I'm sure the book is very smart, but the, the, the title strikes me as, as really missing the point. And the point is we're moving to a post-European world, which is frightening and injurious uh, to America. But that's the, the, the great story. And that this, um, we, see, we see this in Afghanistan where... Um, the EU, which wishes to be a world power, can't find a thousand troops. Well, if you can't find a thousand troops, you're not a world power. It doesn't matter. Well, we saw the same thing. If we saw the same thing in former Yugoslavia, you know, 15 years ago. Right. They they, they don't have a thousand troops. Well, um, you know, wow. <laughs> They're a region of what 330 million people with a GDP uh, larger than that of the United States, and yet they don't have the deployable resources. And that's because they are looking. They have political problems, but they also have. Um, these en- enormous overhanging commitments to their soon-to-be colossal retirement population, so they don't have any fiscal room, and they are starving their military establishments. And when you look at 15, 20 years, it's, it's hard to imagine them being the kind of factor in world affairs that John Kerry in 2004 was promising that they could still could still be. Um, well, I spent a lot of time trying to think about what does this mean. It means nothing good, uh, but it's a reality that we have to we have to cope with. Certainly, I think that they have shown themselves not to be a military power or to have much ambition uh, to do so. Uh, I think economically, it's going to be a, a different story, and I think you can uh, still see a uh, EU playing a, a huge role in uh, this new global economic system. But I think that the larger point can, is, can is you, well taken. Can you? I mean, if, if the EU, uh, if, if the countries of the EU decline from what the twenty three percent of world output they had back in the eighties to the 15% of world output that a lot of people expect them to have in the 2020s. And if Japan goes from 9% of world output to 6% of world output, as, as again, some people project, um, how can, I mean, they're not they're not going to be huge forces in world affairs. Uh, well, I, I think, that, you know, a lot of people would argue with those projections, especially less on the Japan side, but um, on the EU side. They're, they're, of course, I think, counter projections that show them to be at least sustaining, if not in some ways growing, in terms of uh, their share of the global uh, economic system. Uh, but that being said, I, you know, I, I think the, the larger point, however, is is well taken. That uh, you know, I think that to a certain extent, you're right that that kind of sense of we need to win over France and uh, you know a few other European countries, uh, and that their importance uh, is can be overstated. I think in the same way that. The way that uh, George Bush and Condoleezza Rice spoke about the international system in 2000, about the great powers that we needed to get right with Russia and so on, was also a very backward-looking kind of approach, that we really are in a very different kind of global moment right now. One that I'd say is not just an end of a post-1945 kind of uh, system or post-1989 kind of system, but in some ways, we're going to something that's been unseen since, you know, Treaty of Westphalia in the 17th century, that the era of 
foreign policy and of international relations being defined by uh, nation states and by the questions of great power diplomacy or great military actions from big countries is in some ways coming to an end. And that the threats we're facing today, things like global terrorism or global climate change or global poverty, global epidemic diseases, are threats that aren't about old boundaries and threats that aren't going to be solved by uh, diplomats talking to one another in embassies or uh, kind of conflicts that involve standing armies, that these are uh, new threats that move across borders freely and that are a special question to us in an era where most people in the world are living in democracies, even those that aren't have a much bigger effect on their country's leadership in places like China than uh, they would have had before uh, the, the past few decades. Uh, and in an era where you're going to have to have change be the result not just of treaties or things like that, but be the individual changes of a lot of individual people. So yeah. you're going to need people in the Arab world to say, uh, I'm going to take a stand against a terrorist cell. I'm going to provide information about what's going on uh, in my next door neighbor's house. You're going to have to have people change their own practices when it comes to safe sex and things like that to stop diseases. You're going to have to convince a factory owner in China to change his light bulb to uh, have a uh, to have an effect on things like global warming. And in some ways, I think that, getting back to where we began, that is part of the promise of a Barack Obama presidency, that he has, in some ways, a unique ability to speak to people around the world uh, in a way that convinces them on an individual basis to uh, not only change their behavior, but to have a different view of the United States. Well, I think a lot of his supporters hope, hope that that will be true. Um, I, I don't know that we have a lot of reason to think that will actually be true. I mean, he's, one of the things I find sort of striking about him is, um, for all the claims about him as having this, this global background, is he strikes me as about as provincial as your typical American um, national politician. He seems to speak no foreign languages, um, and, I mean, despite all his... Uh, time spent abroad. Um, he doesn't seem to show any particular depth of understanding, um, you know, even much interest. He doesn't seem to have traveled much. He didn't live abroad much after um, uh, he returned from Indonesia. Uh, so the, the case for him uh, as this uh, uniquely globally appealing person, I think, tends to rest on the look of his face and the color of his skin. Oh, I, no, I, think, and, I, mean, I think he has uh, traveled. Under, under, and I think that, that tends to underestimate in fact, the degree of racism there is outside the United States. I mean, that the um, in con uh, the Arab world in particular found it um, very natural to ridicule Condoleezza Rice for the way she looked, and she attracted a lot of race ne negative racist comment in the Arab media. Um, and you know, I, 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 we may be, I, we may I, be here projecting our hopes onto amount. the rest of the planet. Right. I, I do think that he actually has traveled a fair amount, and uh, you know, I think it's not just a question of the way. He looks, I think it is a generational question, which maybe is part of the way he looks, but maybe not in the way that you meant. Uh, and I think it is a sense of being able to uh, go past some of the backward-looking approaches that uh, you spoke about with uh, John Kerry, and I, I was mentioning with the Bush campaign in 2000. I don't think you would hear Barack Obama ever say that our big foreign policy challenge is getting right with the EU. Uh, and I think that that kind of approach is something that, uh, aside from anything about uh, his own background and name and things like that, is something that I think will speak to a lot of people around the world. Well, my, my, I have a positive recommendation that I, I keep making to, to the usual zero effect. I wrote a column about this uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, that George Bush is probably maybe his most important and enduring foreign policy achievement is going to be this new military relationship with India. And yet on the thing you were talking about, building a people-to-people -people type relationship, it's really disturbing how, how little has been done and what may prove to be one of the most important bilateral relationships in the world for the United States. And I'm struck in particular at the unheartfelt way that the United States responds when India, as it regularly is, is, is the victim of a terrorist attack. There was a terrorist bombing in Jaipur and in May, where that left, I think, six, more than 60 people dead and hundred, hundreds injured. Uh, 
And the United States issued, as it always seems to do after these attacks in India, some kind of ritual statement uh, condemning it, of course, uh, but through the, mouth, through the mouth of a State Department spokesman backed by another statement from an Assistant Secretary of State, no comment from the President, no, no visit, uh, no vice presidential attendance at, at the funeral. Um, and that there is a kind of tremendous coldness that we bring. I mean, that the Indians have, had, have been suffering another wave of terrorist bombings all spring. And that's something where, you know, a little em- empathy uh, from the United States on what they're going through. Now, they have the Indian government has its own political reasons for wanting to minimize these atrocities. So it's not just, this is not just an American adventure. I think they, that uh, the United States is responding to the state of the wishes of, of Indian officials. But that means that you're letting the short-term political imperatives of the Indian government drive American behavior in and thwart America's ability to build a longer-term relationship with a nation rather than just a government. Well, it's, it's you know, I would say it's a similar, in some ways, to our relationship with Pakistan, that we have allowed the uh, political necessities of President Musharraf to really call into question our entire commitment to democracy and freedom around the world and yeah. had a kind of sense that the best way to defeat terrorism is by a, having a military strongman uh, rather than to really spread democracy and with the sense that that taking that kind of uh, reversal of the uh, upside down nature of the Pakistan society and removing that poisonous aspect of having a dictatorship yeah. is, you know, I think in a lot of our minds, probably the best way that you could uh, lessen the impact and lessen the attractiveness of uh, al-Qaeda and similar kind of, of threats. And it, again, it is, as you said about India, a short-sighted uh, kind of approach and similar to some of the things I think that we wrongly did during the Cold War era, where we allowed ourselves to dilute our own positive message about America and American values and the attractiveness of American values by getting in bed with uh, a lot of dictators who, while anti-communist, uh, were uh, also anti-everything that we were saying was what we stood for as a nation. This gives me a chance actually to praise, I think, one of the, what will look in retrospect like one of the um, best actions, foreign policy actions of the Bush administration, which is dis- after one bad 24-hour moment of temptation, uh, the refusal to respond in any way to the provocations of Hugo Chavez. Um, and I think one of the things that is a, I mean, maybe it's inevitable, but a way we misjudge what people do in foreign policy is you get lots of blames for the mistake, uh, for the mistakes, uh, you commit. Um, sometimes it is, you, you overlook the bad things that could very easily have happened, but didn't. And, um, that, that the strategy of, of giving this, this thug and creep, um, and, you know, the back of your hand, ignoring him, letting him make a hash of his country's economy, he is going to fall of his own weight. And nobody will be able to blame the United States for interve- intervention or interference. Um, the guy had billions of dollars, tens of hundreds of billions of dollars of oil well- wealth to, with which to make good on his promises to the country. And of course he wasted it all. And when he got, I mean, you can see the end of his regime, I think now, uh, pretty clearly in sight. And that will be something that, that is the natural working out of his own errors and his own, uh, arrogance and, and, and ignorance. So, um, no, I think that that is something, it's, it's a lesson about that's, it. That's something for which, the, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to give people credit for it, not pulling the lever, not pressing the button, but sometimes that's a very difficult thing to resist doing. And it's, it, 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 it's is, one it is one of the hardest things, and one of the most telling signs of leadership, I think, is the uh, ability to stand back and, as you said, not take that action. To me, I mean, that was the one of the great virtues of the Berlin Airlift, was that when really everybody was pushing Harry Truman to make a decision between uh, starting World War III over Berlin and, you know, firing our way through the Berlin blockade uh, of the Soviets or what most of his military leadership and State Department leadership and a huge part of the Democratic Party wanted to do was to abandon Berlin. Uh, He decided not to make a decision to see if this airlift could work. It's, I think, what the great virtue of John F. Kennedy's resistance to making a similar kind of choice during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, it is the sense of uh, trying to, uh, you know, in some ways push a decision uh, down the road uh, and hope that you can actually preserve some options and not blunder into either appeasement or disastrous war. So what, are you going to be pressing copies of this book on uh, candidate Obama and urging him not to abandon Iraq? Uh, you know, I think that there's probably a lot a lot of lessons. I mean, you know, candidate Obama doesn't re- need to read about the Berlin airlift to make a decision. I bet he does. Uh, 
about that. But I think it does actually present some uh, important uh, questions, really, not only about Iraq, but also about uh, American politics. I mean, uh, you know, part of this book is not just, and part of the story of Berlin Elf is not just what was going on in Berlin, but what was happening in America at that time, because this was right during the 1948 campaign. And you had a race not just between uh, Harry Truman and Thomas Dewey, but in some ways the more important race at the time was between Harry Truman and Henry Wallace. And the people associated with Henry Wallace, uh, who was, of course, another one of Franklin Roosevelt's vice presidents and uh, in some ways had greater claim to being Roosevelt's successor, uh, were very much pushing for an abandonment of Berlin and an abandonment of America's uh, role in the world just as we were getting started. And it is uh, something that I think is telling about where the Democratic Party is today that uh, those kinds of voices of uh, retreat aren't really uh, at the forefront anymore. I think that that is part of the lasting legacy of Harry Truman was that that Wallaceite wing was banished from wait, being wait, at the wait center of the... You, you take my breath away. I, I thought the voices of retreat were absolutely ascendant. I mean, as, as Joe Lieberman uh, discovered to his cost when he lost his his uh, seat in his nomination seat, in, his nomination for the Democratic seat in Connecticut, um, and that's what this whole Democratic primary contest has been about. The uh, the the Democratic presidential candidate with the more moderate foreign policy uh, views was soundly thrashed by the Democratic candidate with the less moderate views. I don't think that's right. I, I think you know you. Could, you can't just take Iraq as a proxy for American engagement and active involvement in the world. You don't see somebody out there saying we should not be pursuing a fight against al-Qaeda. Uh, we should be withdrawing uh, back into the United States and not worry about the problems of the world. You know, Barack Obama oh, no, is the one who, who went out there and said that we should be uh, taking military action in Pakistan, uh, even if President Musharraf didn't want us to be doing so, uh, in opposition to a lot of other Democrats as well as to uh, a lot of Republicans. So that's not exactly a Henry Wallace kind of position. His position on Iran strikes one as a kind of Henry Wallace type of position. In which way? Well, um, the, the, uh, uh, his, the, the real debate over Iran is not the debate, do we talk to them or do we not talk to them? I mean, we've, we've, right. been, tr- we've, we've been trying to talk to them for 30 years. They, they don't want to listen. They don't want to talk back. And they have their own reasons for it. Um, the, it begins with what do you understand to be the sources of their behavior? Um, do you think that they have that they are misbehaving for internal ideological reasons of their own, or do you think that when they do things we don't want, it's because they're respond, responding to some kind of previous mistake on our part? And that that was the core of the Henry Wallace case with the Soviet Union. He wouldn't say, "Oh, every you know what they're doing in Czechoslovakia is great." Uh, he was saying that they were when they do things we don't like, it's it because we drove them to it. It's our fault, and uh, that's. It seems to me is the core, certainly what a lot of the people around Obama give him advice about Iran, and that that his emphasis, his particular emphasis on face-to-face negotiations between heads of government uh, that he's been talking about, where you know the president of the United States should actually meet the um, uh, the president of Iran, who's not not their head of state, but who is their head of government, uh, and thrash out our differences. Um, that I think emerges from a sense that a lot of the reasons we find them so obnoxious are because they are responding to misperceptions uh, to uh, maybe even behaving quite reasonably um, to genuine threats we pose to them, rather than seeing them as working out an, ide- an internal ideological logic of their own. Yeah, I don't, I don't hear that from him. I, I definitely don't hear him saying anything like that the actions of the Iranian regime are in any way being shaped by our own missteps. You know, maybe there's some advisors, as you said, who have said that, but you know, as you know from being involved in politics, a lot of people claim to be an advisor who don't get, actually get their advice listened to. Uh, and I think that you can also overstate his emphasis on face-to-face diplomacy. You know, this whole debate came out of a uh, answer, I think, that was in the YouTube uh, debate, and he was asked the question and answered it and has maintained that that's still his position, but I don't think that that means that that is at the forefront of his foreign policy thinking, uh, just because he says that he will talk to them. I think that he actually has a, a much more nuanced and, and much stronger take on uh, America's role in the world, and uh, I think it is one that does very clearly marry America's military and moral strength to one another, and that, to me, I think, is the big debate in Iran and and elsewhere, is that a purely military response uh, is as much of a failure as a purely moralistic response, that you actually have to 
have strength uh, in the service and in tandem with promoting American values, and that you have to do those two th things together. And I think that's what he's saying in Iran and elsewhere. Well, well fingers crossed. Let, let's hope you're right. Um, let me end this by just recommending to anyone uh, to the dozen viewers who made it to the end. Um, I, I, I have not yet finished uh, Candy Barnes, but I, I found it um, a little embarrassing to discover how much less I knew about the Berlin airlift than I thought I did. Um, this is one of the central chapters of modern history, and I, I learned a great deal. And I think your um, the ambition behind your journal is, is really commendable. Um, and I, I always read it with, with great attention, and I, I really um, admire what you're, what you're trying to do. And just reminds me of the gap that was left on our side when the public interest closed and how um, how much we've suffered by not having anything to replace it. Well, I appreciate that, and uh, not just because of uh, my interest in fair play, I uh, have to similarly recommend uh, your book, Comeback, because it is uh, in a kind of series of, of books that come out among the most very thoughtful about both the challenges of the Republican Party and the challenges of the conservative movement. Uh, you know, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, we need a vibrant conservative uh, set of ideas in American politics, and we need that vibrant debate. That's what our journal is about, promoting on our side. And I think that uh, you and the book and all these your other writings have been really keeping on doing what you did back in the 90s, which is really be at the very, very forefront of pushing what is a new vision of conservatism. So I really appreciate the kind comments. I, I thank you. Before we become entirely senatorial here. <laughs> the gentleman from Whistler. <laughs> That's right. All right. Good to talk. Likewise. Thanks a lot.